obviously what I'm going to talk about is our approach to iAnalyze um, spin analysis tool. And before I get started, what I'd like to say is I think you know, if you have any questions, please ask as we go along. I think it's more important to have a dialogue around what we're, you know, around the topic than for me to necessarily try and get through all of my slides. So if I don't get through all the slides, that's fine as long as we really have a have a pretty good dialogue. So excuse me, what am I going to talk about? So the first thing I thought I'd do is give you a little bit about who is Cargill, because we're a business to business company. Um, we're actually may not be as top of mind to a lot of folks. Um, who are more used to maybe seeing some of the business to the consumer companies we just see. Um, we talked a little bit about the sourcing transformation. So I think a little bit of background around the sourcing transformation. That was really, I think, part of the catalyst for us to implement and I analyze. So I think it's important to understand that contextual background. Um, talk about some things that we did to drive adoption and to drive success in the I analyze tool. Uh, talk a little bit about some of the early successes that we had. And then just a, a quick summary and wrap up of kind of what we talked about. So the first thing I wanted to talk about is who is Cargill. So as um, my, my great intro introduction, Clay, Clay yes. indicated, Cargill is, a, is basically an, an agricultural company. Right? We're one of the largest privately held companies. We have um, over 140,000 employees. We're in over 60 countries. And our business is really organized around four sort of business um, strategies or focuses. So the first is agricultural where we really are sort of a, a purveyor of agricultural commodities. Our food business, and in our food business, what we really are is we're a key supplier to many of the food brands and retailers that you um, know very well, names like McDonald's, Coca-Cola, Target, Walmart. Um, in the financial services area, what we do is we help our uh, customers, basically help our customers manage risk. So a lot of our customers um, are in agricultural commodities, we have energy trading, the metals, um, financial services, uh, off uh, desk as well. And the focus of those businesses is really around risk management. <clears throat> Excuse me. And finally, in the industrial sector, we actually provide some industrial products. Uh, one industrial product, for example, is a biodegradable um, lubrication, lubricants for industrial processes, so for cutting and those kinds of things that are uh, much easier to dispose of and have a lower uh, environmental impact. Um, so in terms of size, uh, if Cargill were a publicly traded company, we would be the 13th largest company in the US, and so we'd be number 13 on the Fortune 500 list, just behind Valero and my current Bank of America. Uh, you know, this is based on data from 2011. Uh, it shows $120 million of revenue. I think our revenue for our last fiscal year was closer to $130 million, uh, so we've grown a little bit. Um, but, you know, probably one of the largest um, companies that you've never heard of. Probably not a lot of $130 billion companies that a lot of people have never heard of. Um, but that's, that's a little bit about who we are. So what I want to talk about next, I want to talk about our sourcing transformation. It's, it's interesting, um, I was just in this room and I was listening to Rite Aid, and they basically had a very similar story. In fact, it's in, there's at least two or three of my slides that are almost exactly the same as their slides. Um, so it's not probably a, a something new. I mean, if you've been in the strategic sourcing or the procurement area for a while, a lot of companies have, have undergone this kind of transformation. Um, and again, the only reason I'm going to talk about it is it really is sets some of the context for why we, we ended up implementing uh, spending an analytics tool um, I analyze. <clears throat> so in two, 2010, uh, we embarked upon a transformation, and really what it was, we had historically had what we call a global procurement function, but it was actually pretty decentralized, and wouldn't that be central resources? A lot of the people from global procurement were embedded in the business units, um, and we thought that there was an opportunity actually to deliver greater value by changing the way we thought about procurement. Uh, so the transformation really looked at three areas of improvement. So number one was realigning and restaffing the organization. So we thought we needed an organizational structure, and we thought we needed a, a, a nice mix of experienced cardio talent along with some talent that we would bring in from the outside. The second thing we did, we adopted a rigorous standard approach to category sourcing. So we wanted to be really clear around what our approach and our process is, our process is for, for category sourcing. And then finally, we implemented supporting tools, processes, and technology. And really what those were about was about making our efforts a lot more efficient. And so we wanted to make sure that we had the right underpinnings from a process tool technology perspective to be efficient. So I'll just quickly touch on each of those three areas. <clears throat> so here's one chart we saw very similar. 
Um, so, so Cargill, we, we changed the way that we're organized. And really, if you think about what Cargill is, Cargill is a very decentralized, we have 75 independent business units. Um, our, what strategic sourcing is responsible for is we're responsible for the, what we call the indirect and direct non-raw. So it's basically everything that we buy that's not a traded commodity. So we're not responsible for buying corn or soybeans or um, cattle or hogs, but pretty much everything else that we would buy uh, would be the things that strategic sourcing is responsible for. It's about $9 billion of uh, indirect spend. And because the business units is really where that $9 billion is spent, first we organize ourselves around business unit. So you see we have North America, Latin America, EMEA, and APAC business units. And then you see NABSST, which is our business strategic sourcing teams. Those teams really serve as what I would call a BRM. So they're the business relationship manager. Um, they're generally co-located with the business. We have uh, people that are actually sitting with the businesses to really understand what the business needs are. The next area that we organize around is we organize around categories. So you can see on the left-hand side, we have our category leads. So we're organized by category around five basic categories. Plant materials and services, which is generally speaking what most of us would think of as MRO supplies. Corporate materials and services, travel, um, financial services, management consulting, those kinds of things. Um, chemicals, because we're a food processor, we, we use a lot of chemicals. Packaging and ingredients are our last three uh, categories. So we organize first by business unit, then by category. And then we also have my team, which is the global COD and operations team. And really our team, our role is really to support the category and the business unit teams in the sourcing events that they're, um, they're executing. So we're, in some respects, we're a function of a function. Right? So our, our role is really to support strategic sourcing. Are you going to speak to how the category leads to interface with the sourcing managers in the years? Are you going to speak to that? Um, I wasn't, but I certainly can. So the question is, how does the category leads um, interface with the, the, um, the, the business unit, the PRMs, basically, the strategic sourcing unit? So that's, I, I would say, if there's anything in this organizational structure that's been the, the biggest point of contention, it's probably been that. Um, aligning what we want to do from a global categories perspective with what is um, desired by the business units. And so what we do is we actually have um, fairly frequent meetings between our global category leads and our business strategic sourcing team leads to really understand and discuss and sort of um, negotiate a plan that meets both the global category needs as well as the business specific needs. So it, I wouldn't say that it's a perfect process, but it really is, it's a matter of let's sit down in the room together, we meet, for example, in North America, each of the categories meets on a monthly, most of them on a monthly basis, some of them on a quarterly basis, to really go through what's the plan, what the business units want, how does that fit with what we want to do from a global perspective. Um, we lay out an annual plan each year that looks out for the year, and we try and overlay what we want to do globally, as well as what we want to do from a business specific perspective, um, so that we can gain that alignment. Um, I would say that's been one of our biggest growing pains, and I think we've gotten a lot more efficient at that over the last three years, but I think there's still some, some room to grow there. Yeah. If, if the category's not a global category, yeah. and it's very regional, yeah. th is that independently managed by the business units, or still the category leads will implement some standardization on contracts or something? Yeah, so if, you know, the question is for those, like, those categories are regional. So we, we look at our categories a number of ways, right? Um, so number one, there are some categories that are probably just truly regional categories. Those things tend to be sourced regionally. In fact, there are some categories that are sub-regional, country level, maybe even a region within a country. Um, so for those kinds of categories, we identify those countries and or those categories, and they're handled by the regional mm -hmm. categories. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. Um, there are some categories where we think the strategy should be global, but the execution and implementation of the strategy is regional. Right, so there's another, the second tier of categories where, yeah, we can, do the, we can pull the same kind of levers across the different regions, but how we do it in Europe might be a little bit different around how we do it. So your levers are your levers the volume, but your levers for the process of the Exactly. Experience. So if you know, if it's a make by decision, yeah. If it's a make by decision, we'll make we'll do that make by decision in each region. Each region may come to a different answer, but we might have the same strategy, which is let's let's look at make by and see which is the lowest total cost of ownership. And then there are some categories that are truly global. You know, a great example is IT, right? We all have Dell laptops. Um, regardless of what region you're working in, what region you're working in, in the world, we all use the same kinds of laptops. So we, that's the way I think we think about our categories from a regional, uh, regional perspective. 
So the next thing we did is we really implemented a, a you know a pretty disciplined and a very well um, defined process. Uh, you know, right? They put their process up. I think it's a seven step process. Ours is a five step process. Others have a nine step pro you know nine step process, whatever. So a standard process. But you know, one of the things having a really standardized process and really understanding what are the, the steps and the tasks and the activities underneath each of, each of those process steps is really the thing that sort of led us to the conclusion we need an accurate spin data. Right? There are a number of things that we're doing as we're going through and trying to do a sourcing of that, which really depend on having accurate spin data. You know, the first thing is to define the need, right? I mean, you don't know where you should focus you know, unless you know how big your spend is. Who should be on the team depends on who are the big stakeholders in that spend, which business units you know, are really spending a lot there. Um, things like we're looking at hypotheses. It depends on you know, how much are we spending on those commodities, whether or not you think it's just a price, price play or should it be something you might look at outsourcing. You know, and all the way over to the, to the very right hand side, you think about ongoing uh, value management, strategy refinement, right? It's, it's understanding from an ongoing perspective how has this been changing? Are you acquiring businesses that are added to the spend? Have you done spin-offs or divestitures? You know, so this, the spend and understanding the spend, we quickly realized was central to a lot of the things that we do. And that was really what drove us down the path of saying we need a spend visibility tool and eventually led us to uh, implement an IA analyze. <clears throat> the next step was process tools and technology. So, you know, as we were transforming the organization, it was really clear that we had some gaps. There were some things that we didn't really do real well. And I would probably say, first and foremost, and, and, and again, it's, it's a recurring theme that you've, you've probably heard throughout the day, is this idea of value measurement. Right? How can we as a strategic source and our organization really credibly come to the business <coughs> units and say, we have saved you this much money? So we put in place a very robust and a very Discipline plus process around that measurement. We require each of the business unit controllers to sign off on our value um, that we say that we're delivering on anything over hundred thousand um, dollars. It's you know, it go, and they go back to the stakeholders. They they call the plant manager and say, hey, are you actually going to implement this new water treatment process, or are you actually going to be able to change out your packaging equipment and get the kinds of savings that strategic sourcing is saying you're going to get? So we put a really robust value measurement process in place. Um, you know, we had a supplier database tool, but we recognized the need as we started signing more contracts. We needed a way for our end users to find our contracts and utilize those contracts. So we beefed up our, our supplier database. Um, we put, put in place uh, a new sourcing tool. Again, we had a new sourcing tool, but we, we recognized the need to even leverage that tool further if we we're going to be doing more events, as well as to allow those events to be a lot more disciplined in terms of um, how we selected suppliers, how we um, had some. Um, some historical perspective around the decisions that we made and why we made those decisions. And then finally, we, we understood that we needed to spend the analytics tool really to define where our opportunities were, to prioritize some of those projects. Um, and we selected I Analyze after a, a very robust um, um, RFP process. And actually, I probably should have said at the beginning, one of my colleagues, Michelle Fletcher, is in the room. She works on, um, is in the COEOS team, and she was in, uh, instrumental in the selection and the implementation of I Analyze as our spend visibility tool, and to this day is the sustainment manager and, and keeps it keeps it alive and, uh, and accurate. Uh, one question. So this is in 2010. Yep. What was Carrigan's approach before 2010 on regards of spend and analysis? Yeah. So so we were probably where many people were before they had those spend analysis spend analysis tool. Um, we have. We're mostly a JDE-based uh, business. We're, we're transitioning to SAP, but we probably had 30 instances of JDE. We had spend. We had a lot of businesses that did spend in Maximo. We had businesses that did spend in ASAP. We had businesses that did spend in Adage. We had businesses that bought everything on a peak card. Um, I would say prior to having this spend analytics tool, it took us probably um, three to six months to do a bottoms up. This is what we spend. Right, to really find the, the full $9 billion. Uh, we probably did it every 12 to 18 months. Right? It was such a painful process that we didn't want to do it very frequently. Yeah. So yeah, oftentimes we're heading into a sourcing event and we're looking at data that was a year and a half old, um, you know, a year, year and a half, two year old data. 
understand what our spend was, and, and in that case, we'd reach out to our suppliers and say, what did we spend with the It's embarrassing. It's embarrassing. It's embarrassing. So it was, it was a very painful bottoms up. And then, um, um, another quick question, sorry. Uh, sure. And uh, category wise, do yeah. you have your own taxonomy or do you have SPSC? Yeah. What do you use today as your category? Yeah. So, again, a common refrain. Um, we started with one SPSC. And as we started to dig more and more into spend analytics and understand how we're going to how we're going to categorize stuff and working with our category teams, it became clear that even SPSC out of the box, off the shelf, wasn't going to work very well. So we said we'll come up with a hybrid category. I mean, sorry, a hybrid taxonomy. Um, I would say that that hybrid taxonomy quickly became a custom taxonomy. I would I would probably characterize our taxonomy as having maybe one um, thing in common with with UNSPSC, and that's that it's. It's four two-digit characters, right? So we have a four-level taxonomy. Yeah. It's, so it's, four level, right. it's a four-level two-digit taxonomy, but short of that, it's probably not that. We started with an SPC, right now it's a fully yep. customized. Fully customized, um, four-level, two-digits, reach-level taxonomy. Was the taxonomy developed before or after the implementation of I and what? It was developed really in conjunction with I and what? Yeah, as we started looking at our spec data. Yeah. Well, did you find it flexible enough to allow you to change over the custom without a like, tremendous amount of effort and change management? Yeah, so the question was, <laughs> was the tool flexible enough to allow us to change from UNSPSC to this new taxonomy? And I would say absolutely. There's no sort of um, embedded taxonomy in the tool, right? The tool is completely um, mm -hmm. open to whatever taxonomy you want to implement. So there really wasn't much change management from a tool perspective. Where the change management was a big challenge was just internally with our category teams, right? I mean, one of the biggest change management issues was trying to get them all to agree on what the taxonomy should be. Well, the people in well, Asia Pacific want one thing, the people in India want something else, North America wants to be categorized, you know, yet another way. So the bigger challenge is with, within strategic sourcing, all of us trying to agree that this is the way the taxonomy is going to look. And in some cases, we just had to go down, get to the point where category leader decides to make a decision because we're not going to get consensus here. How many categories do you have? Uh, so at level one, we have five. At okay. level two, we have about 50. At level three, 600. And at level four, 1,200? Okay. Is that right? Probably something like that. Something, something that way. Yep. So, so what, what did we do to drive adoption? So we've, got, we, we've gotten, yeah. Real quick, on that last comment, what level do you create your category strategy? So what we, sort of our philosophy is that levels three and four should be what you call a sourceable category. So it's, in some cases it kind of depends, in most cases I would say it's at level three. For some of the really complex spend, like some of the MRO categories, um, the sourceable category is at level four. So it's either level three or level four, is what we call a sourceable category. And even some in IT at level two. Right, so there's some IT stuff like, you know, there's fairly large level two categories. Um, so, so what did we do to drive adoption? <clears throat> so I would say that there were really, there were really three things that we did um, to drive adoption. So I would say, you know, one of the things that you've got to think about is if you're, if you're thinking about a tool and how you really drive adoption for a tool, I think when you when you are implementing the tool, that really sets the foundation. That sort of lays the groundwork for broader adoption by the team later on down the road. Right? So for example, if you're getting ready to launch a tool, you're implementing a tool, and you, you promise the organization, we're going to have a spin analytics tool, we're going to have it in place, it's going to be January 1st of 2014, January 1st comes and goes, no spin analytics tool. You know, February comes, March, April. May. Finally in June you launch the tool and they haven't heard anything about it. Your credibility is already going to be hurt in terms of adoptability. So, you know, so what we really did is we really started with implementation. And there were three things that we did in implementation that sort of laid the foundation. So one was we really focused on communication and change management. Number two, we were really open um, and really transparent on project decisions. And then number three, we put a lot of focus on training and implementing the right set of support structures uh, for end users once the tool went by. So from a change management perspective, Cargo actually has a very specific uh, change management framework. Uh, as part of the project team, we have a dedicated internal change consultant. 
We made sure that change management stayed um, top of mind. Uh, we created what's called a change network. So we actually had a team of individuals in strategic sourcing. You know, think of them more as sort of the shop floor folks, right? The people that are hearing the water cooler talk and know what's kind of being said in the grapevine, right? So we could hear kind of what are the rumors? What stuff is bubbling up? What are people concerned about? Um, so that we could hear what was going on on the sort of the grassroots level and sort of begin to address some of that stuff through some of our, our communications. Um, and then we really engaged our strategic sourcing leadership team in terms of uh, you know, giving you a really specific action. You know, here's what we want you to do. We want you to talk about this at your, at your town halls. We want you to talk about this for your leadership team meetings. Here are the talking points we'd like you guys to cover. You know, here's the status of the project that you should take your team through. So we were very, I would say, very deliberate about how we thought about change um, and how we managed to change the communication so that, you know, out the gate, we made sure that we're bringing the entire sourcing organization along as we were going through the project implementation, we didn't just drop it in their lap and say, here's a new tool, now use it, right? We sort of brought it along, and, and I think the other thing that that did is it actually got people kind of excited, right? I mean, they knew it took months to figure out what their spend was if they were gonna launch a, um, a category or a sourcing event. And so knowing that this tool was coming, they were in some respects, they were kind of salivating, you know, we were really hopeful that they were gonna get really good spend data at, the, at their fingertips. So focusing on change is one of the things we did, I think, that really paid off uh, in the long run. The second thing we did is we were really transparent around the decisions that we made, right? So we have this incredibly large, incredibly complex uh, structure of spend. And as we looked at what we wanted to spend on this tool, it was really clear we weren't going to bring, be able to bring everything in, right? So we really had to make some decisions around which spend would we bring in, which spend would we not bring in, um, would we bring in our key card spend at this point? And there was just a lot of decisions that we had to make. And so one of the things that we did is we're just really transparent with people, right? I mean, we said we're not bringing in the spend in our starch and sweeteners business in China right now, right? Small spend, really difficult to figure out what that spend is. Um, it's just not going to be worth the effort, right? So, you know what, if you don't have that kind of dialogue, right, people, the first thing they do is they go on the, the, the tool, and they'll say, like, I don't see the starch and sweeteners spend in China. This tool's a piece of crap. You know, I'm not going to use it. So I think by having a very methodical approach and being really clear and transparent with people about the decisions that we're making, and you may disagree with the decision. You may argue and say, yeah, I want the starch and sweeteners spend in, right? But at the end of the day, you understood what the rationale was, right? We, were, we had a, a number of factors that we looked at, and we were really, really clear around what we were going to do. And then we communicated those decisions broadly to the organization. So I think that sort of heads off some of that downstream stuff, right? Where people say, well, how about the PR spend's not here? How come you know, my little business unit in Upper Mongolia, how come their spend's not in here? Uh, and so being really transparent, I think, was very helpful um, later on in the project in terms of gaining buying for both. Now, of course, it's not perfect, right? There's been always people that are going to kind of complain that their little pet spend didn't get in, or you know, I want to be able to spend, see spend by plant or something like that. Um, but it did, I think, it went a long way towards sort of heading off some of those discussions and some of those issues that we might have. Yeah, question? Uh, that kind of uh, is like a, a map of here's what's in, here's what's out. Yeah. Like, Correct. Like, and so um, with that in mind, is that something as you maybe made decisions to bring things in that were previously out, do you keep that updated? Is yep. that still something you utilize after the project is on? Yeah, that, that's a great point. That's actually, I think, it's one of the points later in the presentation. But the question is, you know, so we, we actually, what we did is we actually mapped every source system that we thought we could find across the company. We made a conscious decision of which ones we're bringing in, which ones we're not bringing in. And so now what we have is we have a list of gaps, right? So we have this list, and here's the gaps, right? And so what we can do on an annual basis, Michelle and I sit down, and we're going to say, okay, you know, here's our gaps. How would we prioritize these? How much is it going to cost? We'll go back to the leadership team and we'll say, okay, here's the, here's the spend we'd like to bring in. Here's how much it's going to cost to bring that spend in. Do you want to do it or do you not want to do it? So it's, yeah, it's a great tool from an ongoing perspective as we think about continuing to improve the, improve the product, right? Improve the tool um, to make some decisions. And then we also have to update it. We're going to acquire businesses. We're going to sell businesses. You know, think we're going to discover things that we didn't know. Uh, so we also bring those things in and identify those gaps. I mean, one of the things that's happening right now is we're going to SAP. And as we transition to SAP, our source systems are changing a lot. And 
And so that's one of the things that we've got to think about is, you know, when we take a business off of JVE and put them on SAP, do we lose that spend? And if so, what's it going to take to get that spend back in the tool? And as an owner of the tool, so to speak, you also own sort of this roadmap or this document yeah. too. Yeah, so it's, it's up to Michelle and I to put together, you know, a set of recommendations around, you know, here's what we would, rec we would, here's what we would recommend, right? Here's the roadmap. Um, and then we take it to our leadership team and they sort of say, yep, these are the, let's do these three next year because it's going to be, you know, we got 250 thousand bucks to spend on <coughs> And we keep sort of <coughs> that road now on a long way basis. So the final thing I would say we, we, we really did is we were implementing um, IAMLIs is we put a lot of focus on training and support. So we did a lot of training sessions and, you know, Cargill, the company, we operate in 65 countries, excuse me, strategic sourcing. We probably have employees in a dozen countries around the world. Uh, and we put a lot of effort in making sure all of those employees got trained. We did both virtual and in-person in training sessions. We did, uh, for those of you who are aware of, of what happens during spin, spin um, analytics when you're implementing it, we did something called perception alignment, where you actually go out to the regions and you sit down with the end users and you go through your spend and you look at a transaction and you get the team together and say, okay, this transaction is categorized to be, you know, plant materials and services equipment spent. Is that correct? Right? And the team says, yeah, got it, that's correct. So we spend a lot of time and that helps the team understand how the tools how the tool works. It also helps them understand some of the limitations of the tool. Right? And so if you get a spend that's described as work order number one, two, three, it's going to be really hard for the tool figure out where that spend is categorized, other than it might guess it's probably something in plant materials and services. Right? So that's probably as good as you're going to get. So it also, I think, helps the tool, the teams globally understand what some of the limitations of the tool are. Um, so we traveled to each of the regions, um, did both face-to-face uh, -face as well as virtual training. Um, we set up a network of super users. Uh, and the super users, what their role was, it wasn't to go in and pull spend and work in the tool for, you know, you couldn't come to the super user and say, hey, I'd like to understand you know, what's happened with the spend in China in this particular category. The role of the super user was to help people understand how to do it for themselves, right? So if somebody had, had a problem logging in, or somebody needed to understand how do I bring a dimension into a report that I want, or, you know, my report's too big, how do I get it, make, you know, how do I refine it so it's a little bit smaller? It was that kind of stuff. It wasn't, you know, using the old um, analogy. We weren't fishing for people, right? What we are really doing is we were teaching how to fish better. Right, so by having people get in the tool and really own it, I think that drew a lot greater adoption than it was just some tool that you went to my team and said, here, pull this data for me, and, you know, come back to my queue today from now and we've got the data and, and drop it off. Uh, yeah. Um, how did you guys pick the end users? So the question is, how do we pick the end users? So actually, for us, everyone in strategic sourcing is an end user. Right, so we gave the tool to every single person in strategic sourcing, as well as some select people basically that asked for it outside of strategic sourcing. So there's still some people in the businesses that are doing what I would call transactional buying. Right? If you think about classic strategic sourcing, you'll probably manage 70 to 80 percent of your spend strategically. That always means 20 to 30 percent, the long tail, a lot of transactions that's going to be managed tactically. So we have tactical buyers that are doing that work. So we gave some of our tactical buyers access to the tool. But basically, we gave it to everyone in strategic sourcing as end users. And we expect everyone in strategic sourcing to know how to use it. The, the, yeah. power, the power users were analysts or were also cons heavy consumers of the information yeah. that just happened to know yeah. more about So we spread the super user network. We, we sort of intentionally spread the super user network out. It wasn't just the analysts from my team, right? We picked some. You know, we try to find people who are analytically savvy and, you know, it's interesting because you have to find people that are analytically savvy, but you also have to find people that are able to explain what they do in a manner that somebody who's not analytically savvy can understand. So what we try to find is that right mix of, they had the new analysis, they, they were pretty good at communication skills, and then we try to find people that were both within our team as well as outside of our team, so some folks in the categories as well as the business teams and our team. There was another question. Yeah. Uh, did you find that at all within your strategic sourcing organization that, that they sort of designated certain people? So you give it to everyone, but then we get a couple people who are just really analytical minded. My, so in my strategic sourcing group, I have an analyst who we all as a team vote to. Yes, yeah, so the question was 
even though we give to everyone, do we find that there are some people that use it more? Absolutely. Yeah, so, you know, it's, it's interesting. Not only um, does it, it sort of vary within a team, it varies by team. We find that there's some teams that they just, they take this stuff like it's up to water, and they're in the tool, you know, almost everyone on the team is in the tool that the business machine sourcing team needs in there, getting spent for their businesses. We have other teams where they're pretty much, you know, they got a couple of guys out of college on their team and they say, yeah, I'd like you to really do a lot of the analytics and pull a lot of the spend for us. And so it varies greatly. But I would say that almost everyone in strategic sourcing is at least minimally functional in terms of being able to do sort of basic things in the tool. Um, and then you've got a smaller cadre of goals that are what I would call power users, right? And maybe can make this, you know, can really make the tool safe. Yeah. We are considering now opening up our tool to be used by other users. And one question that came up is can a user see like other people's expense reports? Um, are they allowed to see certain data? like how much how much a contractor gets paid or something. Yep. So how do you overcome that challenge for yep. people who can't see? Yeah, so the question is around if there's confidential information or confidential data within the system. So I would say we did a couple of things. So number one, from a contractor perspective, what we try to do is filter out all names. Right? So we don't want to have anyone's name uh, flow through the system now. You know, I don't know how do how do contractor spend? Does it just come through as a summarized spend? Um, contractor spend varies. We don't pull in an ATV system like we have at Star. We really try to avoid any employee names from our data pulls. So yeah. We in our systems as an employee, and we try to really be careful that we didn't have confidential information. Is that perfect? No. Yeah, and we don't have team. We don't pull that. In. We have a travel. We have a team team table. System. On the back end, so that way you can always go back to the C, the employee names that were once hidden, like to that way where basically everybody sees it as a generic name, employee yeah. A, employee B, or not. From an employee perspective, we don't do that. Oh, it's blocked. Yeah. 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 So we pulled from about 25 systems into a central database. We don't even pull that into our central database. That's probably the only filter we keep from JDB into our central database. It's just so sensitive, we try to keep it as far away as possible from us. Yeah, and it's not sourceable spend, exactly. Right? I mean, it's common benefits. We don't really want common benefits to be flowing through to our indirect sourcing tool. Now, if it's contract or spend, it can flow through. But if it's employee spend, so travel. So travel is its own system. It has its own system. Yeah, we have a travel and entertainment system that we don't pull a fee from our TV system into our IDL system. Yeah. And then I would say there were a few things, <clears throat> excuse me, there were a few things that we did after we went live that um, you know we're, we're hoping and we're fairly confident should ensure some sustained adoption. So the first thing we did is we made it really clear that the teams that are using the data own their own data, and they play a key role in, this, in system maintenance. So, you know, interestingly, if you, if you implemented a spin analytics tool, it's kind of it's an interesting thing, right? You work really, 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 really hard. You get this thing implemented, and you roll it out, and sort of go, hey, this we're done, right? And then the first quarterly refresh comes along, and a whole bunch of new data comes in, and you're almost, you know, you're not back to square one, but to the system, this is brand new data. It's just like you're starting from scratch, right? So there's this constant effort that's required, right, as new spend comes into the system to, make, to ensure that the data in the system stays relevant. And what we've done is we've been really clear to the category teams that they own that. That's, that's their job. So if you're in the chemicals category, it's your job to make sure your chemical spend um, on a quarterly basis. You're, you're looking at your spend, you're providing feedback, you're recategorizing, you're normalizing suppliers. Um, so we're really clear to the categories that that's what they do. Now we help, we'll facilitate, but it's their role, it's their responsibility. Better. Uh, that was part of my question, and then how easy does the system make that feedback for? Yep. So the system actually, I mean, I would, I would say, and maybe you're, you're probably better, you're better positioned to uh, answer that question. But I would say from my perspective, the system is actually pretty good at allowing feedback. There's actually two ways that you can provide feedback. You can do what's called online feedback or offline feedback. 
Right? So you can actually, within the tool itself, go into the tool, provide feedback, and that feedback will get uh, accumulated and fed back into the eigenwise artificial intelligence engine. Or you can do it offline on a spreadsheet, right? So you can pull a bunch of spend out of the system, download it into a spreadsheet, say, yeah, this needs to be here, this needs to be there, this needs to be here, and then send that in. So it's, um, you know, there's some quirks and there's some challenges in how you do it, but I would say basically it's pretty, um, pretty efficient. Michelle, would you yeah. agree to share another perspective? I mean, she, she manages the quarterly refresh process, and so she's, she sees all of the pain that you might have when you're trying to do quarterly refresh. But I would say generally speaking, it's pretty efficient. What's the time commitment for the quarterly refresh from the businesses, for example, for the strategic sourcing? Category teams? Yeah. I mean, ideally, if everyone each quarter would spend four to eight hours a quarter just looking through their categories and sustain that, that would be good. It's, we're still working on getting everyone to do that on a regular basis. Um, and we obviously have challenges in Asia with languages and things like that. We don't have sourcing team members that help off the language and things like that. And what we find is that, you know, to really keep people motivated, we kind of got to go there and sit down with them. So Michelle's getting off with the fly lots. Actually, the government shut down, delayed her trip to Asia to go and sit down with that team to go through their data and help them. You know, we're, we're hoping we don't have to do that forever, but you know, we've really only been on the system for a year. And in fact, yeah, because that was the last one to out in October. So we're still sort of new at this process. Yes, it's according to the refresh, how often do you feed the data you send a monthly signal or how often do you send the spend? You mean in terms of the spend data? Yeah. So we send a, a, a spend signal on a quarterly basis. So once a quarter, yeah, we'll spend a, we'll send a quarter's worth of data to Zykus for them to categorize. Uh, I think the feedback, though, is monthly, is that right? So we process online monthly between the quarterly refreshes, and then offline, which comes to a spreadsheet, is done during the quarterly refresh and modeling. So we, we actually chose to do quarterly refreshes. I've talked to other folks that actually do monthly refreshes of their data. Um, but it's a big enough um, process that quarterly was as frequently as we wanted to tackle. Yeah, other questions? So your spend data, is it fair to say that it's a quarter of the data behind? Yep, it's always a quarter of the data. Okay, so you're not seeing spend data that is uncategorized. No. No, so yeah, the data in the system, yeah, it's not raw data coming out of the transactional or the, the, the uh, accounts payable system. The only data that you're seeing in the system is data that's been sent to Zycus, they've gone through, they've cleansed it, um, and categorized it, and then they posted it to our, you know, to our, our live data account. Yeah, so it's, it's um, clean, clean spent data. Okay. Now, is, is it payments made or invoice posted? It's payments made. It's posted data. Uh, so the second thing we did, we do, is we solicit input on system enhancements and we communicate the disposition of those inputs. So we ask the team, what would you like to see in the tool, right? Um, one of the things we talked about, I think I talked about earlier, is the CapEx OpEx. Teams came back and said, we'd be really good if we could see CapEx and OpEx out of the tool. So we provided a CapEx OpEx split for data. Um, another thing they asked for is they said, hey, we want to see spend by, I think all we, they want to see it down to the zip code, right? They want to know what specific plant spent what data or what what dollars we, we analyze that and said right we're not doing that right now right so that was something they asked for we said not now maybe later we'll do that but we have other things that we need to tackle right now so we do ask for input we don't do everything you know we don't, we're not able to implement everything the team would like but if we can't implement something we go back and say hey we're not going to do it and this is the reason why we're not going to do it so i think that helps also keep people engaged in, in ensuring that the tool is working um, we provide updates right so we talk about here's what, here's what the next quarterly refresh is going to be Here's when we're getting new functionality in the tool. Um, here's, what, here's when we're going to close down online um, feedback because we're doing um, a refresh of the data. Um, you know, the tool is down, here's the reason for the tool being down. So we're, we're um, and Michelle bears the brunt. Um, she's very good at providing you know, updates around what's happening with the tool. Uh, so <coughs> people think we're never surprised. Never, if, they, if they don't need to do but they should never go to the tool, find out they can't get in, and sort of say, I didn't know the tool was down. Right? If you read your email, you'll know what's going on. Uh, then the final thing would be to provide ongoing training both for new team members and fresher training for, for, for um, people who've been around for a while. 
Um, so I'll talk about just a couple of quick successes. Um, we had we did some work around payment terms, spend categorization, and uh, managed spend. So I'll go through this really quickly. Um, so I analyzed it really gave us visibility to the, to the the number of payment terms we had across our businesses. We had in excess of 80 different payment terms across all of our different payable systems, ranging all the way from blue upon receipt to net one income, right? Sort of pretty much everything in between, right? So the other thing it gave us is it actually gave us now the data to understand what the size of the prize was. So now we can tell, you know, how many dollars we have on payables terms of due upon receipt. How many payables terms, you know, do net 10, do net 20, do net 30, net 45, and you know, all the way up to net 180. And by thinking through what we thought might be some optimal payment terms, we were able to get a sense of what the size of the prize was. So, you know, thinking through, you know, if we could get everybody to sort of an average set of, of payment terms, we identified up to $200 million of uh, working capital that we could um, improve just by optimizing payment terms. Now that's, you know, that's sort of the scene, right? We know we won't be able to get all of that, but it gives you a sense for how big the opportunity is in terms of rationalization of payment terms, right? So that was one of the early successes that we got from the system. And that's with, you know, payment terms that are not the best. I think over time we can continue to get better on payment terms. Um, another thing we did is we, um, we identified some opportunities and categories. So I analyzed and confirmed that our total indirect spend is $9 billion, right? We, we thought it was $9 billion. I think the first number we got was somewhere between $8.5 and $8.8 billion. Um, so it confirmed, yeah, $9 billion is pretty much the right number. But what we did find is that there were some categories that had significantly more or less spend than we thought. Uh, for example, we found that these three categories, lease and rental equipment, waste disposal, and paint scaffolding, scaffolding. collectively there was, they were $180 million in those three categories. I think if we had um, guessed at what we thought was in those categories prior to high analyze, we would have come up with a number well south of $100 million. Right? So we would have said, you know, 100, you know, 50, 60 million spread across three categories, it's not a packet. $180 million spread across three categories, much, much higher probably. So it really helped us identify where some of our priorities might be. And then the final thing it did is it really, well not the final thing, but another thing that it did, is it really helped us understand um, our managed spend. Right? So this is a, a chart that shows of our five categories um, where we think we have spend under management. So you can see in packaging, where almost 90% of our packaging spend is, is managed. In chemicals, almost 80% of the spend is managed. In ingredients, only 25%, right? So there's an opportunity, 75% of our spend in ingredients, we don't have any strategic contracts for. If you look at plant and and services, more than half of our spend in the plant and chosen services area, we don't have uh, strategic contracts for. So it really helped us understand, and I think we probably would have guessed that these were about, you know, we're better in packaging than we are in chemicals, but what it really does, is it now allows us to uh, do focused events and measure and see how this is going to change. And this is actually also based on fairly rough data. We're, act we're actually also implementing another enhancement to analyze to provide much more accurate spend, uh, managed spend data. So in the next, probably not this coming quarter, but the one after that, this will be able to basically, this is sort of a little bit of working, we'll be able to push a button and spit the chart out. <laughs> So what we do is we, we look at our spend by category, and then what we've done is we've gone around each of the category and we said, who are your select suppliers? Give us the list. So now we know their list of select suppliers in their category, and then we can take a look at the total spend in that category, see which is with those listed suppliers, and then what's left over, and then we do it a calculate that way. The enhancement we're gonna do is actually allow that list of select suppliers to get um, sent to IAnalyze so they can sort of flag it as um, managed spend or unmanaged spend, and then we'll get the data back um, much more efficiently. That's a simple, simplified version of it, Michelle. Would so you will set a list to map your spend, and this list, uh, of course, is dynamic. So yes. next month, you yes. will remove a couple of that. Yep. Yep. And, and this will be refreshed in that Correct. analysis. I'll, yeah, so that, will, that comes out of our spend database, right? So we have a spend database. And so that's our sort of source. That's going to be our source of record for select suppliers. Right, and that's dynamic, right? As contracts expire, they come out, as new contracts get signed, they go in. And then that's what we our our spending or to spend. Or copy that prior to the There's another question? There are questions. 
Yeah. So in summary, um, I would say the first thing we did is really around setting the stage for the adoption, so it really starts from the implementation process. And at least in our case, we found that there were three things that we did, I think, that really helped. Number one, a laser focus on change management. Right? So bringing everybody along, it's going to be an end user, as you're implementing the tool, um, is very helpful once it's implemented. Number two, complete, trans excuse me, complete transparency on the decisions that you've made. Right? So being really clear with people around, this is what's in, this is what's out, here's the rationale. Um, you know, you like it or not, but you know, don't come back and say, I'm surprised that I can't find this thing, because we're very clear. And then finally, it would be a significant investment in training and support. And then after go live, there's some things that you need to do, I think, to keep the pedal to the metal. Um, so number one, holding the teams accountable for maintaining their data. Right? It's not my data, it's not Michelle's data, it's not you know, the center of you know, the COA team's data, it's the chemicals team's data, it's the ingredients team's data, it's the packaging team's data, the EMEA packaging team. They've got to feel responsible and ownership for their data. Um, make some enhancements to the tool based on user input. So ask for ways that you can enhance the tool and be clear around those decisions. You won't be able to do them all, but it's, it's a big win when the team comes back and says, I want to see CapEx OpEx, and you're able to pretty quickly turn that around and say, yep, now you're going to be able to see CapEx and OpEx in the tool. Uh, keep it in users and well informed in the status and plans, not only the day to day status, but the long term plans, right? So the fact that in, in a couple of quarters we're going to have spend under management, I think that's going to be a huge win for us. I think it'll really help our category teams really understand if the, the, the contracts they're signing or the users are really using those. Um, and then finally, it provides ongoing access to training. So it's really important that as new people come on, as um, people just forget how to use a tool, that you have some amount of um, ongoing training and 